Good evening, Bearcats. This is Unit 2, the extra practice problems for your test. And we're going to start with number 1, which is a quadratic function. And we're being asked to find the zeros. And remember, again, we find the zeros. It's like we're setting the equation equal to 0. Um, in this particular case, I don't think I can, we have a negative in the front for 1. I also don't think I can multiply to 4 and get to 6. So I'm going to go straight to the quadratic formula. Quadratic formula, just to review, is negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac. Of course, it's all over 2a. Um, Whenever we do the quadratic formula, you want to clear out the negative in the front. So if you multiply through by a negative all the way through, in this case, you would get x squared plus 6x minus 4 equals 0. You can do this when you're solving. Just remember when we get to graphing that the negative in the front does mean that the graph would turn downward. And if you look at it in this form, you would think it turns upward. So just keep that in mind when you're graphing. But for solving, you can do this, especially if you're plugging into the quadratic formula. So now our a value would be 1, our b value would be 6, and our c value would be negative 4. And we will just plug it in. So we would get negative 6 plus or minus, because that's a negative b, square root. So 6 squared would be 36 minus 4 times a times oops, c all over 2 times 1. And that's negative 6 plus or minus the square root of a number all over 2. And we're going to figure out what that number is. You have to be very careful. Remember I told you already, if you have a negative subtraction here and you have another negative, it's going to end up being plus a positive. So that's going to be plus 16. 16 and 36 is going to give us 52. Um, so there's our answer. If we would put that in the calculator, the blue calculators, you would get approximately 0 0.60. And I can't remember. I think I have a, I think I had a mistake on this. 609, 605, 601, I can't remember. Um, I'm going to say 9, but I think it was maybe 5. Um, and negative 6.609, or 5, or 1, I can't remember. But you'll get it when you put it in the calculator. All right, and I don't have a calculator with me right now. All right, let's move on to the next problem. All right, on this next problem, again, we're um, finding the zero, so we're setting our equation equal to 0. Um, in this case, let's see if we can do our factoring, our slip and divide method. Slip and divide. That's where we take the coefficient in the front. You only use this if you have a coefficient in the front. We're going to slip it over here by this last number, so we're going to slip the negative 5 over here. When we do, we have x squared minus 4x. We have a negative 5 times a 1. We're going to multiply those together, and we get a negative 5. And now let's see if we can actually factor this. x and x. Multiply to 5, add to 4. I believe we can 1 and 5 would be a negative 5 and a positive 1. Now we have to divide this number back in. So be really careful you don't forget that part. Divide. This was the slip. This is the divide. So you divide the numbers by negative 5. This one by negative 5. So this case we would have x. 1 over negative 5 is negative 1 fifth. And in this case we would have a negative over a negative. So it would be x plus 1. And therefore, our x values, our zeros, would be positive one-fifth and negative one. And that would be our answer. Go Bearcats. All right, one more to find the zeros for. So again, we set it equal to zero. Um, let's see. Can we multiply to 9 and add to 3? I don't think so, so I think we're back with quadratic formula. One nice thing here is we don't have a negative contend with, and there's no coefficient. So our a value is 1, our b value is 3, and our c value in this case is negative 9. So negative b, which would be negative 3, plus or minus the square root of b squared, that's 3 squared, which is 9, minus 4 times 1 times negative 9, all over 2 times 1. So we get negative 3 plus or minus the square root. And remember, the number underneath there is called the discriminant. That's kind of a big word for you to know, the discriminant. Um, remember, if, I, if you're subtracting and you have another negative uh, after here in your quadratic formula, it's going to end up being positive. So 4 times 9 is positive 36. So we have 9 plus 36, which is 45. 45. And I will probably let you just leave it just like that. If you want to simplify your radical, remember we talked about that. So 45 divided by 5 would be 9 divided by 3 would be 3. There's a pair of 3. So 3 
square roots of 5 would be simplified. So you could write this as negative 3 plus or minus 3 square roots of 5 over 2. Woohoo! Go Bearcats! But I will accept this as well. All right, once again, we're trying to find the zero, so we're setting our equation equal to zero. Ah, but we have a fraction. Please do not forget. Do not fear the fractions. We have a fraction here. We have an, a numerator and a denominator. In a fraction, it's the numerator that will allow our fraction to equal zero. So whatever x values would cause the numerator to equal zero, that would be our zeros. So we're going to go over here, and we're just going to make x squared minus 9x plus 14 equal to zero. Ah, well we might can just factor that. Let's see. X and X. Multiply to 14, add to 9. 2 and 7. And if we make them both negative, they'd multiply to a positive and add to a negative. Woohoo! Alright, so we would have X equals 2 and 7. That would be our zeros. You can pause and take a look at this if you need to. I'm going to move on. Okie dokie. Now we have a square root. Now we have a square root. Remember, if we're trying to find the zeros, we just want our square root to equal zero. Well, for a square root to equal zero, that would be the square root of zero. So we just need to make whatever's underneath the house here equal to zero. So just take what's underneath there, set it equal to zero, and solve. We'd move the five over, get two x equals five. We would divide by two, and x equals five halves, and that's our zero. Not so bad. All right. One more practice on odd, even, and neither. Um, I'm going to give you some rules if you can remember the rules. If not, remember for odd functions you're going to change the x to a negative and the y to a negative and see if you can get the equation to come back to its original form. And then it would be an odd function and also be symmetrical with the origin. If it's an even function, you're going to change your x to a negative and see if you can get your equation to come back to a the original form and it would be an even function or it would have y-axis symmetry. Um, if it doesn't have one of those then it would be neither odd nor even. There's some shortcuts though. If it's an odd function then all the exponents are odd except be really really careful because you have a constant and that kind of knocks it out of the um, rule. That rule rule is because that would be a one so those are both odd numbers but it knocks it out of the rule so in this case this would be neither. This would be neither because of the constant. If there was no constant there, if it had just been x to the fifth minus 4x, it would have been an odd function because both of those exponents were even, but that constant kind of throws us off. All right, let's look at the next one. We have both of our exponents are even, so we're going to say it's an even function. Now, if we had had x to the fourth minus 20x squared plus a constant, let's say, if we're adding a constant and we have even functions because these automatically go back to their normal self, then this would also be an even function. So just take a look at that. So it's with the odd exponents and a constant that you run into trouble. All right, let's take a look at this last one. And we're going to do a little substitution. We have an even exponent and an odd exponent, although they really is, this is really one term. Um, so we know that it, it appears it would be neither, but let's take a look at what happens. We're going to try to test for, um, let's, let's try to test for even first. If we plug a negative in here, it's going to make this whole front term negative. If we plug a negative in here, it's going to go back to its original form. And this one changed, this one went back, so this is not an even function. Let's test to see if it's odd. All right. So let's take a look. Let's make a make this a y value. And we're going to change the y to a negative equals 2 times negative x and the square root of 2 negative x squared plus 3. All right, so we have y negative y equals negative 2x square root of that negative x squared would be just going back to a positive 2x squared plus 3. Now, because this is all one piece of information, if I multiply this whole thing by a negative, it would change the y to a positive, and it would change my 2x to a positive. It would not change anything underneath the house. And it would go back to its original form. These match. So this is an odd function because it has origin symmetry. All right, that's a little strange one. So remember, one more time, take a look at the rules. Odd, 
all the exponents are odd unless you have a um, constant then it would be neither but if all the exponents are odd it's odd unless you have that constant for evens if all the exponents are even even if you have a constant if all the exponents are even then it's an even and then if you have a square root or something like that you really need to probably test it out um, because if that in this case if that little x square had not been squared then it would have been neither so you know it's, it's one of those little things you probably need to do your test for symmetry for odd and even functions all right moving on all right the next one is our average rate of change and please note here this is the equation for average rate of change it's really a lot like a slope if you remember that f of x is really a y value so you have a y value at the top minus a y value and then just the x is at the bottom, x minus x, so it's y minus y over x minus x, which is very similar to a slope formula. So just kind of keep that in mind, except that this represents the function at the top. So x sub 2 is 3, so I'm going to cross this out and make it a 3. x sub 1 is 1, I'm going to cross it out. This is 3, this is 1. Remember when we did these before in the review, I said do the easy part first. So the bottom would be 3 minus 1, which is 2. So we got that part done. All right, at the top, we've got f of 3. So imagine we have f of 3 right there. So we'd plug a 3 in. I'm going to do that over here. So we'd have a 3 in parentheses squared minus 8 times 3 plus 4. Well, 3 squared is 9, and 8 times 3 is negative 24 plus 4. And I believe that we will get... Uh, that would be 20, negative 20 and a 9, so that would be negative 11. So this is negative 11. I'm going to put negative 11 here, and that replaces our f of 3. Now we're going to subtract. Be really careful about the subtraction. That's the subtraction sign right there. Now do f of 1. So imagine that you're going to plug a little 1 into the x's. So you would have 1 in parentheses squared minus 8 times 1 plus 4. We get 1 minus 8 plus 4. Um, let's see, that would be 5 and a negative 8, so it's a negative 3. So we already have the minus sign, and it's a negative 3. Be careful, that's plus a positive. That's where you'll miss it if you miss it most of the time. Be careful in your math. All right, and that equals a negative 8 over 2, which happens to equal negative 4. Our average rate of change is negative 4. All right, here's a picture of our next graph. Mine's not very pretty. The one on the paper is much prettier. Um, and we're asked to determine the intervals for which the function is increasing, decreasing, or constant. Well, just when I look at this right off the bat, I don't see anything constant. Remember, constant's when it's that straight, flat, horizontal line. So I, have, I don't happen to see anything constant in this one. I'm going to find my turning points. My turning point is here at negative 2. I have a turning point here, which would be when x is 0, and I have a turning point here when x is 2. So those are my key values. I know that moving toward negative 2, I'm decreasing. Moving to 0, I'm increasing. Moving from 0, I'm decreasing. And moving from 2, I'm increasing. So those are visually what happens. So let's list my intervals. Let's do the decreasing intervals first. All right, so my decreasing intervals. Since I start over here at negative infinity, and I'm going to end at positive infinity, so from negative infinity to negative 2, I'm decreasing. And I'm decreasing again, remember, right here, which is from 0 to 2. Increasing. All right, I'm increasing from negative 2 to 0. And I'm increasing from 2 to positive infinity increasing and decreasing intervals. All right, now we're asked to evaluate. Evaluate's really basically solving, so we're plugging in and solving. So we're solving for f of negative 1 into this um, greatest integer function. So I'm going to just substitute in first. So I'm going to have 3, and I have the greatest integer, and I'm going to plug in my negative 1 minus 2 plus 5. I'm going to simplify a little bit, and my greatest integer now is negative 3 plus 5. Now, look here. This is an integer. If it's an integer, then use the value that's in there. If it's not an integer, then you have to think on a number line, look to the left. What is the biggest integer to the left of that value? But this is an integer. So we really have just 3 times negative 3 plus 5, negative 9 plus 5, negative 4 would be my output. All right, let's try the 14.5. 
So we have 3. We have the greatest integer of 14.5 minus 2 plus 5. All right, we have 3 and still the greatest integer, 14.5 minus 2 is 12.5 plus 5. Now, here's the deal. This is not an integer. So think about a number line where 12.5 is and look to the left or in your mind, look to the left of what the biggest, what the greatest number to the left would be. That would be 12. Hopefully you get that. So it would be 3 times 12 plus 5. 3 times 12, sorry, sorry, 3 times 12 is 36. 36 plus 5 would give me 31. All right, go Bearcats. We're going to do a couple more. All right, we're going to evaluate again. So here's another inter greatest integer function, and we're going to plug in to see what our values are. So we start with negative 1 times the greatest integer, and this time we have 3 fourths plus 3 minus 1. All right, I'm going to write over here. So that would be a negative 1, the greatest integer. 3 fourths plus 3 would be 3 and 3 fourths. 3 and 3 fourths minus 1. All right, so again, imagine you're on a number line at 3 and 3 fourths and look to the left. What's the biggest number to the left? 3. So this would be negative 1 times 3 minus 1. Negative 1 times 3 is negative 3 minus 1 would be a negative 4. That would be your output. All right, one more of these. Negative 1, greatest integer. This is 4.8. Let's make that a negative 4.8. Let's practice a negative. Negative 4.8 plus 3. Negatives are always the hard ones, minus 1. So we have a negative 1. Negative 4.8 plus 3 would give me the greatest integer of negative 1.8 minus 1. All right, I'm going to go over here and look at my number line. Here's 0, here's negative 1, here's negative 2. Negative 1.8 would be about right here. If I look to the left, oops, there's my one negative 1.8. If I look to the left, this is my biggest integer left, less than that number. So negative 2 would be my output. Negative 1 times negative 2 minus 1. Negative 1 times negative 2 is positive 2 minus 1, which gives me an output of 1. Go Bearcats. All right, let's graph a piecewise function. These are really important that you get these in pre-cal. You'll see these a lot going forward because life doesn't usually happen in one nice little straight line or one nice little curve. It happens in different kind of pieces of things, so different little parts of a problem that come together. So in this case, I want you first to observe the equations themselves. This is a linear equation with a negative slope. This is a constant, flat horizontal line. And the third one here is a linear equation with a positive slope. So kind of keep that in mind. So you're going to have a line moving to the down on the right. You're going to have um, a line that's constant horizontal. And you're going to have a line moving up on the right. So that's what you should look like. But it's only going to be part of these lines. Please use a t-table. <laughs> Please use a t-table. We're going to have three, well, the second one you don't need a t-table for, but you're going to have two t-tables. We're going to start with negative one. Put a negative 1 where x is. You're going to plug negative 1 in for that x. So you have, I'm going to just do it over here to the side, negative 2 times negative 1 minus 4. That's 2 minus 4. That is negative 2. So negative 2. So you have negative 2, negative 1, negative 2. Let's go ahead and graph. Negative 1, negative 2. Now, there is no equal underneath this inequality, so I'm just going to put a big open dot right there. That's my starting point. I'm going to graph another point where x is less than negative 1, and I'm going to move toward that point. So less than negative 1 would be, let's say, negative 2. So I'm going to plug it in again for this x. So I have negative 2 times negative 2 minus 4. That's 4 minus 4. Ah, that's a 0. I like that. 0. So at negative 2, I'm at 0. So I'm going to go back to my beginning point, and I'm going to draw a line toward that second point with an arrow on the end. That is my first piece of my graph. All right, now I'm at a constant, a flat line at 2, okay, a flat line at 2 between negative 1 and 2. So at negative 1, I'm going to go up to 2 since there's an equal sign underneath there. At negative 1, neg at negative 1, 2, I'm going to put a solid dot. And then I'm going to go to 2. At positive 2 to 2, I'm going to put an open dot. 
because there's no equal sign there. And I'm just going to draw a flat straight line across there. Okay, that's my next piece of my graph. And then finally, let's get to the third one, T table. Start with the two. Okay, you remember, notice we've used all of the numbers in the restrictions. So we're going to start with a 2, and 2 minus 5 is negative 3. That's our first point with a solid dot. So 2, 1, 2, and we're going to go to negative 3. 1, 2, 3, solid dot. Remember, this is a um, slope, positive slope, so it should go up on the right. That should be our hint. We want a value greater than 2. Let's pick 3. 3 minus 5 is negative 2. So at 3, we're at negative 2. All right, well, that's just moving up, and you could just draw a line going like that, and that's the third piece of your graph, and that's what your graph would look like. So be really careful. Use the T-table. Use all of your restrictions. Go Bearcats. All right, I believe this is our last one of the evening. Um, let's take a look at this greatest integer function, and we're going to actually graph this one. And I would say on greatest integer function, you really want to use your transformation rules. So if this is x plus 3 in here, remember all the x stuff has horizontal movement, opposite of what you think. So our graph is going to go left, 3. And then this minus 1 at the end means it's going to go down, 1. So there's our rules to follow, but we need a parent function. Our parent function is just simply the greatest integer function, the greatest integer of x. And our parent function would look something like this. We would start with a solid dot at the origin, an open dot at 1, and we would connect them. Then we would step up, and we would put a solid dot here, open dot here, connect them. Solid dot here, open dot here, connect them. Solid dot here, open dot here, connect them. And the same thing, there's an open dot, solid dot, connect. Open dot, solid dot, connect. Open dot, solid dot, connect. Okay, that's a parent function. Now what we want to do, I'm going to do it in blue, we want to graph our transformations. So we want to take those points, move them left and down one. So I'm going to go back to that original one at the origin and go left three. One, two, three, down one. And the open part of it, I'm going to go one, two, three, and down one and connect. I'm going to do that with one other and see if the pattern is the same. And if it is, I'm just going to then grow from the pattern. So count one, two, three. Ah, I think it is. Oops, yes. And down, oh, down one, sorry. And open dot one, two, three, and down one. And there we go. And from there, you could just do your pattern because it's going to be the same. All right, and there would be your new graph. All right, Bearcats, I hope you do well on your test tomorrow. Please study both this um, online extra practice and the online review that I put on on Friday. Um, have a great rest of your weekend. Go Bearcats!